Okay, so big thing we want to go over here, first couple of things, is actually just that. Let's talk about um, what our weekly assignments are going to be. So each week there are actually four assignments. The first one is the meet session. You can meet this requirement in one of two ways. Either you can attend the meet session. So those of you that are here now, get your points for the week. I can go back in actually and check the attendance. Um, the meet records that for me and lets me know when you logged in, when you logged out. So I can see that you were here. You'll get your points just for being in the session tonight. Um, if you have to leave early or you'll come in late and you're worried about it, you can do the meet quiz. Or if you don't attend at all, there's a meet quiz that will be posted here and will be posted as an object in Blue Quill. That needs to be submitted to my email. Make sure you list that it is Q1WW either in the subject or at the top of your email so I know what course you're from, what section you're from. Second set of assignments come from WebAssign, and it's the WebAssign homework. The WebAssign homework is worth, of course the meet quiz is worth eight points each week. The WebAssign homework is also worth eight points each week. Now when you do the WebAssign homework, there are help, and many of the questions are help topics. Hints, um, connections to the e-textbook, the section of the e-textbook or whatever, that'll help you solve those questions. So you should be able to do really well on the homework. Homework is basically graded for completeness if you reach the threshold of 80%. Because you need 80% to open the quiz. If you don't get at least 80% on the homework, the quiz won't open for you. And like I said, you can repeat the questions as many times as you want to. And there are those, well, not as many times, but you can repeat, I think, up to six times. And then there are help topics for those questions that will give you hints and whatever on them if you're struggling with things. So really, the only limiting factor on the homework as far as getting that 80% is time. So I always recommend people on that homework, start early in the week. And break it up over a couple of days. Don't try to do it all at once. I mean, it's going to take you at least a couple hours um, for most of you to do that homework. So don't try to cram it all in. I have a lot of students that get in trouble. Um, everything's due on Sunday evening. Well, they, they start at 6 o'clock Sunday afternoon thinking they're going to get it all done. And that homework takes longer than they think, and they don't get the quiz done. <clears throat> the second part of the web assign work is the web assign quiz. The web assign quiz is 16 points each week. That, of course, there is no help topics. It is a one shot. You get one chance to do the quiz. You can't go back and repeat it as many times as you need, like the homework. Um, that's where you're demonstrating what you know. And then the fourth thing is application assignment. And the application assignment, I believe, is 16 points most weeks. It varies between um, 16 and, and 24 points, depending on the week. The application assignment is where the assignment pairs come in. I want to talk about the assignment pairs a little bit. Choose a partner or group up to three. To discuss assignments with. Now, need to be clear on this one because it's a little confusing. A lot of students mistakenly think that that means you can work on the application assignment together and submit it as the same work. It's not quite how it works. For the application assignment, you can discuss it with your partner or partners, but you still have to go back and answer the questions in your own words. <clears throat> so sit down with your partner, connect with your partner with that 
that application assignment in front of you. Go through and discuss it, but maybe don't fill out your answers. If you need to jot down notes, that's fine. But then go back later and answer those questions in your own words. It is still an individual assignment. There are really no official group assignments in this course, but the assignment pairs are just there as a resource for you to discuss um, the application assignment with because it is a little bit different than what you see in WebAssign. Um, so it might not look exactly like what stuff looks like in the textbook. I see there's a question here, so I'm gonna flip back. Do you have to have partners? Good question. That comes up every, every class as well. Um, you are not required to have an assignment pair. If you want to go it totally alone, that is up to you. I'm not going to force you, but it really does make life easier to have somebody to bounce stuff off of. So consider it. But no, you don't lose points if you're not working with a partner. All your assignments are still submitted individually, so I will never know if you're actually working with your partner or, or even if you don't have one. Um, I will post what the pairs are here. I've got to sort through my emails and get some lists written down. I will get that posted to the people that have declared that they're in assignment pairs. If you want me to assign you to somebody, let me know. So I'll match up people that are looking that haven't found. Um, but if you don't tell me that you want me to assign you to somebody, I won't assign you. I'll just leave you working alone. So be aware of that. All assignments are due. Sundays at 11.59 p.m. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so for the web assign homework, if you were to get a problem wrong, um, do you have to wait to redo that problem once you've gone through all of the questions or can you just redo the problem like that you're on, I guess? The web assign homework should allow you to check the problems Every problem you do, you should be able to check your answer and redo it before you move on. Okay, because I did the first homework that we have. I did the first question, I missed one. And then okay. I went to redo it and got it wrong. And it said I couldn't try another question. So I was just a little confused. On some of the, the first assignment where it's a multiple choice or stuff, short answer and stuff like that, WebAssign might have limited algorithmic questions. Um, so it might not be able to generate more questions. What happens when you get the question wrong and you go back to redo it, WebAssign will change the numbers. Um, they have algorithms that do that. And so it's it very possible that they only had two variations of that question or something and you couldn't, couldn't re-answer. Or maybe there's only one variation of that question that wouldn't let you answer it. Okay. Um, but the homework is graded, like I said, on completeness. As long as you hit that 80% so you're ready to take the, the quiz, you have your full eight points. Okay. If you're short of that and there's a problem like that, let me know and I can try to help you adjust that score so that you can get into the quiz. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, now another thing we need to mention is attendance. Franklin has a very strict attendance policy. You're required to complete at least three class activities a week. Now a class activity can be submitting an assignment. There's four assignments a week. So if you submit all four, you've had four class activities. So that's, you've met more than your enough requirement. Um, you can attend a meet session. Well, for this course, a meet session is an assignment. So that kind of fits in with number one, or you can contact the instructor. Send me an email, keep me updated on what's going on, whatever. Um, most of the time that contact with the instructor, obviously if you, if you need to contact me about to, to meet your attendance, that means you haven't completed at least one of the assignments. Usually that's about an extension. Um, I'll talk about extensions in just a minute, um, but be aware that the email counts as a, as a contact but then the homework, the extended homework does not count because if it's not done by the due date, it is not an activity for that week. So be aware of that. <clears throat> um, after the third absence, you can be dropped from the course. Actually, and that could be, you will be. I mean, the second I mark you absent for the first, for the third time and submit it, you disappear off of my roster. 
I can't do anything about it after that. If you get a second absence, generally I'm gonna be in contact with you saying, hey, what's going on? Is there anything we can do? But be aware of those absences. If you start getting behind on assignments, make sure you're in contact with, with me and make sure you are doing enough so that you don't get marked absent for the week. Extensions on assignments. Technically the official policy is must be at least 24 hours before the due date, must be requested. So that would mean you'd have to request it by 11.59 p.m. Saturday night that you need an extension on the homework for that week. I usually let that slide up until about 12 hours before the due date, so up to about noon on Sunday. But don't send me an email at 10 o'clock Sunday night saying I'm not gonna get done, I need an extension. That's gonna be a late assignment, just so you are aware. You have to, you know, there has to be some reason why your assignment's late, some sort of emergency or whatever, not just, ah, you didn't get it done on time. And like I said, be aware that some of these assignments can take quite a bit of time to do. Uh, the, the web assign homework, some people might take three or four hours to do it for the week. Make sure you've allowed that time. Um, don't try to squeeze everything in on Sunday afternoon because that's when it's due spread it out over the week, chip away at that homework and have that homework done earlier in the week. So if you have questions, you have time to ask. So I see there's a, a comment here. Let me go back to the chat room. Oh, no problem. If you're a few minutes late, that that is okay. That will not affect your attendance. You're here for most of the course, uh, most of the discussion. So that would count as full attendance if you're five minutes late. Okay, so um, what I would recommend as far as your assignment orders or act, order of activities for the week. I would recommend that the first thing you do is view interactive um, modules. Um, Franklin has some videos and some interactive lecture lessons out there that you can access and they're very, they're very good. Also along that lines, I also have some instructor videos that I have created and posted using the, the PowerPoints from the textbook created out there. Those are YouTube links. Those are posted every week as well. So for learning the materials, that's kind of your best, best options there. Then you have the meet session every week and the web assign homework. Like I said, much of the web assign homework has some help topics that you can access that allow you to, to get some help if you're struggling with one of the questions. So the homework is a tool to help you learn the material as you're doing the homework as well. Then of course, from there, I would say the application assignment. Discuss it with your partner as needed. If you have questions, if you struggled on a web assignment question, I have no problem with you discussing that with your assignment pair or your partners as well. Um, they said, just as long as you're not sitting down and doing it together, not sitting over the phone on web assign, pulling up the questions and answering them together. I'm okay with you discussing them with each other. And then the last thing I would say is the last thing you should do each week is the web assign quiz. The web assign quiz is the only thing that's really high stakes. You cannot go back and redo it. Once you've done it, you are done. No, there's no second chance at it. So that, that's the, I would save that to last until you are absolutely the most comfortable with the material. Now with that said, if you're hitting the end of the week and you're running out of time, um, it's like 10 o'clock on Sunday night, go ahead and do the web assign quiz because the web assign assignments, the homework and the quiz at 11.59 p.m., those will cut you off. Even if you're in the middle of the quiz, it'll cut you off and boot you out. In order for you to continue working past that time, I have to go into the system and, and set the change the date so that you're allowed to keep working on it. So if you're getting close, do the web assign quiz first and then go back and do that application assignment if you have to. You can submit that a little bit after midnight and you're not gonna get cut off. Generally, I give you a couple of freebies during the semester. If you submit it, 
if you're submitting it by the time I uh, get online in the morning and look at my computer, look at the assignments, I generally don't, you know, cut hairs about exactly what time it was submitted. So you got, if you need a little leeway, that's the assignment you can take it with. Anybody have any questions on procedures or, or types of assignments or anything like that? Okay, so let's take a look at our general material then. Statistics is, uh, has a bad reputation. Has a reputation as a tough, a very tough topic. So the question is why study statistics? Well, there are a lot of reasons why to study statistics. Um, people that are good with statistics, there's a lot of jobs out there that you can get into. Um, high paying jobs actually that are out there that, that require or that use statistics as their main function. We're not necessarily uh, you know, expecting you to be a high functioning statistician after one course, but some of you have actually had uh, statistical concepts before. If you're building up at this point, you should start seeing some connections. You're getting closer to it at least. Um, but obviously there's more work you'd have to do. The main purpose of this course is to make you a responsible consumer of statistics. What does that mean? Well, there's statistic in the news all the time, especially in election year, saying, you know, the approval rating is 35% of the population approves of the, the job the president's doing, or 42% of the population will vote for candidate A. And those statistics are everywhere recognizing you know what are the possible flaws in those statistics or or what questions should you ask before you believe in those statistics also advertising marketing has statistics all over in it and again understand what it's really saying when they say four out of five dentists recommend you know this toothpaste that doesn't mean four out of five dentists are saying this is the best toothpaste they're just saying this toothpaste meets the minimum requirements that they would want their patients to, to have. And of course, making informed decisions. Most of what would help you make some difficult decisions is gonna to come to you in the form of data or statistics. So being able to view it, organize it a little bit, and then use it to make your decision. In business, informed decisions, statistically based decisions, are the key to a successful business. Um, if we look at most of your major corporations, your CEOs and CFOs, they have two things in common. One is a background in statistics. The second one is a background in accounting. So they understand the money coming in and out, the statistics to, to use the information to make decisions. Types of statistics that we're going to study. Well, there's two types. One is descriptive statistics. And that's exactly what it sounds like. Just describe what's the current situation look like. What percent of the population plans to vote for this president? Um, what percent of the population believes in this law or whatever? Then there's inferential statistics. And this is usually used to predict, like, we predict that this candidate is going to win the next election or maybe make a decision. Well, we feel it's best to, to market this product over the other one because we think this is the one that has the best chance of success. Well, as I said, statistics has kind of a reputation as being a tough topic. And one of the reasons for that is the extensive vocabulary. It's almost like learning a foreign language. A foreign language that's full of words you already know, just used in different ways. So when we look at statistics, one of the most important things we need to define is a population. Population is the group of items or, or people that we want to learn about. Well then from that we have what's called a parameter. A parameter is information describing a population. If we go back to the, to the voting example, let's say that we want to figure out 
Uh, we want to predict who is going to win the election. Well, our population there, you got to be very careful to define it. It's not the candidates that are running for election. I mean, you may think, well, they're the ones that are going to win or lose, but it's not their behavior that answers our question. The, the behavior that answers our question comes from the voters. Who do they vote for is going to determine who wins the election. But it's not all registered voters. It's only the voters who plan to vote in that election or will vote in that election. So a parameter might be people between the age of 18 and 108 or people that are registered voters. Um, that's a, that's a information that describes our population. Population has a lot of parameters. So most of the time we are looking at what's called a parameter of interest. A parameter of interest is uh, information about the population, but it is um, related to the purpose of our study. So a parameter of interest might be that 47% of the population or of those surveyed report that they would plan to vote for candidate A. That would be a, a about our, our sample. So we would extrapolate that to the population and say, we believe that 47% of the population plans to vote for candidate A. A census is an attempt to gather information about a population. The United States is in the middle of a census right now. The 10 year census is going on for 2020. Gathering information about the population. They never have truly achieved a census. They've never actually gotten to everybody in the population. That's difficult to do, um, but they've come close. So the next thing we wanna discuss is a sample. It is a subset of the population. A subset chosen from the population. So um, the subset chosen from the population, obviously smaller than the population. Um, why would we do that? Well, we'll talk about that here in just a little bit. A statistic is information describing a sample. Just like a parameter describes the population, a statistic describes the sample. And a survey, of course, is gathering information from a sample. So you can see a lot of parallels between samples and populations. So actually, we'll go to the next page for this. The big question is, why use a sample? <clears throat> Well, there are a lot of reasons why to use a sample and what's implied of course of that is, and not the whole population. The big reason, the first two are always out there, time and money. If you wanted to try to survey every, well, actually census every voter, registered voter in the United States and who they're gonna vote for, it would take a lot of time. In fact, you probably wouldn't be done before the election would be over long before you were done with the survey. And it would cost a lot. You'd have to pay a lot of people to do it. You'd have to have supplies, equipment, and whatever you were going to use to gather that information. It would be expensive. It can be difficult to define the population. Like we said in our, in our example of saying, wanting to predict who's gonna win the election, we don't care about all registered voters. We only care about those who are going to vote in this next election. Well, there might be people that are absolutely determined that they are going to vote, but something comes up on election day, maybe a flat tire or an illness and they don't vote. Or there's people that say they're absolutely not gonna vote, they don't care, but something happens between now and the election that that gathers their interest and they decide they're going to vote. So we don't know who's in that population yet. So it's hard to actually determine what the population is. Um, changes over time. It's very important that when you gather information that you gather it from everybody under exactly the same conditions. Now that's very difficult to do 
but you have to try to come as close as possible. What do I mean by that? Well, realistic, not realistic, in a perfect world, it would all be gathered in the snap of a finger. You would say, I want to gather information from these 200 people at six o'clock tonight. At six o'clock, all 200 of them will be contacted at exactly the same time. You get the information from all of them at exactly the same time. There's your data. Exactly at the same time, a snapshot. Well, that doesn't have, that's not realistic. It, that's, that would be the perfect world, but we can't do that. So it's spread out. So let's say you're going to spread it out over three days, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So you call a third of the people on Monday. You call another third of the people on Tuesday. Well, then Tuesday night in the news, a major scandal comes out about one of the candidates. Well, you cannot just continue on and survey the last third in the next day because the conditions have changed. Many of the people you already surveyed could have very well changed their mind about who they're going to vote for based on this new scandal. So you have to try to make sure that everybody, all the information is gathered under the same conditions. Now this next one doesn't necessarily apply to people, I hope not at least, but it applies to manufacturing and quality control. And that's destructive testing. Let's say you're gonna make a basket and that basket has to be able to hold a certain amount of force. So what you're going to do is you're going to take one of your baskets, you're going to put it in a machine, and you're going to apply force to it until it crushes the basket. And then you're going to measure how much force that took, and if the force that it took to crush the basket is significantly larger than what it needs to hold, then you're going to say it was most likely strong enough to hold that, that weight. Well, you can't test every basket because testing it destroys it. It crushes it. So you need to test enough baskets to relatively sure the rest of them are going to be good enough, but leave making sure you leave enough that you have enough to sell and make a profit. Now, those are just the main five. There are others out there that you run into that would be a good reason to take a sample over the whole population. But as you can see, it's just, it's very difficult to gather information from the whole population. So most of the time, using a sample is about convenience and using our limited resources. Um, beyond that, we, we're, we strive for something called a representative sample. In a representative sample, the sample statistics are the same as the population parameters. Now they're never exactly perfect, so there's always something called sampling bias. Sampling bias is that difference between, oh, struggling to type tonight. The statistics and the parameters. So if in your sample you predict that 47% of the, the voters are going to vote for candidate A, and then 23% actually vote for candidate A, um, that's, a, that's a huge sampling bias. That's not a very representative sample. We wouldn't be happy with that. That was not a good job. Sources of the sampling bias. Well, there's something called selection bias. In selection bias, the sample is selected in a way that um, excludes part of the population. Maybe it's an email survey that you send out or you, you, you randomly choose email addresses to survey. Well, somebody who doesn't have internet or doesn't have email can't possibly be chosen. They're part of the population, but there's no chance of them being in the sample. They're being excluded. That is a selection bias. There's a measurement or response bias. And in this, the sample is chosen, but the statistics vary from the population parameters because of how information was gathered. And this could happen in a lot of ways. Um, maybe the way you worded the question, you might have worded the question in such a way that, that a certain portion of the population was turned off by your wording. Um, it could be symbolism. If you want to do a political survey and get very liberal responses, 
send it out in an envelope that has the logo of the, the National Democratic Party. And people that are conservative will see that and many of them won't even open it because they're not part of the Democratic Party. Um, so there's things like that that can cause those reactions so that people respond in a certain way or only a certain group of people will respond because of those little influences. And then there is a non-response bias. And in a non-response bias, the data differs from, from the population because the data is not gathered from the whole sample. So you've accurately chosen the sample, but you don't get data from, from, from everybody. And this could be people just refuse to respond, or it could be maybe you're gonna call them on the phone. Well, you chose them into the sample, but then they don't have a phone, you can't gather data from them. So there's all sorts of factors that come into there. We cannot eliminate all sources of bias, but our goal is to reduce it as much as possible. So how do we do that? Well, we cannot guarantee a representative sample. As we said, we can only do as much as we can to make it more likely that it's gonna be representative. First thing, how to increase chances of a representative sample. First thing we can look at is the sample size. I can't walk out the door, ask the next two people I see who they plan to vote for. And if one of them says candidate A and the other one says candidate B, I can't then conclude, hey, the, the population is split 50-50 between the candidates. Way too small of a sample. You also don't wanna to get too large of a sample because then it takes too long to gather and is gathered under different conditions. So you have to have kind of a balance on the sample size. You need randomly selected samples, no bias. You know, don't make sure that when you're selecting it, you're selecting it in such a way that nobody is systematically excluded from that sample. So we have a random sample. What does a random sample mean? That means that every item in the population has an equal chance of being chosen for the sample. Well, that sounds great, but there's actually something called a simple random sample, abbreviated SRS from here on out. And a simple random sample is if choosing a sample of size n, n is the, the, the variable we use to denote the size of the sample. If we say n equals 40, that means there's 40 people in the sample all possible samples of size 40 from the population have an equal chance of being selected. This is a little more difficult to achieve, but not as, not as difficult as it sounds. And we'll go over how that is done in a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about types of samples. There are a lot of sampling strategies that we can use. The first strategy is called a stratified sample. In a stratified sample, the population is divided into groups based on some common characteristics. That's very important. It's common characteristics that, that group them together here then um, items are randomly selected proportionally from each group. Let's say we wanted to survey student satisfaction with Franklin University. And we have master's degree students, bachelor's degree students, um, certificate students, they're not non-degreed students. We could 
split them up into those groups, make sure we get some from each group. Now, if there's twice as many bachelor's degree students as there are master's degree students, that term proportionally means we're gonna choose twice as many bachelor's degree students to be in our sample as we do master's degree students. But also a key word there is random. It's still random selection. So everybody has equal chance of being in. This is a random sample. Everybody in the population has an equal chance of being selected. It is not, however, a simple random sample because in a simple random sample, it would have to be possible to choose a sample that everybody came from the same group. Everybody was a master's degree student or to choose a sample that excluded one group. Um, not that you did it intentionally, it was done randomly, but it would have to be possible. Next is something called a cluster sample. In a cluster sample, we still divide the population into groups. But now it's based on proximity or based on ease of gathering data. Then whole groups are randomly selected. So now here, here's the thing. Um, the big difference between stratified and clustered, there's two of them. In the stratified sample, the groups are grouped together based on a characteristic. Master's degree students, bachelor's degree students, certificate students. In a cluster sample, they wouldn't be grouped together based on characteristics, they're great, great, grouped together based on proximity. So they might be grouped by based on what class they are in at one in the afternoon on Tuesday. So then we would select in, in stratified, we would randomly select from each of the groups. Some from every group would be in the sample. In the cluster sample, we select whole groups, complete groups. So we might select the class that you are in at, at two in the afternoon on Tuesday. So somebody would come to that classroom, survey everybody in the classroom, so they can get a large number of responses all at once. And then you know, all the other classes that were selected, somebody would go there and select the data from them as well, gather the data from them as well. So the, the complete group, if, a, if one person in the group is selected, the whole group is selected. Um, whereas in the stratified, just it's randomly from within each group. The cluster sample, like I said, is based on resources. If we just randomly selected students and tried to gather information from, we have to track down all these different students. But by selecting complete classes, we just show up at that classroom and gather the information from them. It's a lot more efficient. Uh, we don't have to be running all over the place. This is random. But again, not simple random. Because it is not possible to choose a sample that includes one person from every group. Because either their whole group's in or their whole group's not. There's a systematic sample. We randomly select a starting point. And then the system selects the rest. Let's uh, look at quality control for manufacturing. Let's say that I wanna select, we need to test one out of every 100 parts. So we might randomly select a number one through 100 every morning, put all those numbers in a box, mix them up, pull one out. And let's say it is 42 for the day. So that means we will test the 42nd part coming off the line. And then the system takes over. Every 100 parts after that, we test the 142nd part, the 242nd part, the 342nd part. So the system determines, after that first a random starting point, the system determines the rest of them. This is a random sample because every part has an equal chance of being chosen. But it is not a simple random sample because it's not possible for two parts in a row to be part of the sample. There's something called a convenience sample. Convenience sample is take what is easy. This is like I said, I run out the door and I just survey the next 100 people I run into. That's a convenience sample. Convenience sample is not even random. So if it's not random, it can't be simple random either. 
convenient samples need to be avoided. Um, there's a, a convenience factor in almost all samples, but you want to limit that as much as possible. So what is a simple random sample? Well, put all the names in a hat, draw, draw out the sample. So put the names of every registered voter in the United States in a hat, mix them up, draw them. Obviously that's a big hat, in a bin of some sort, mix them up and select them out. This doesn't have to physically be done with a, a bin or a hat. It can be done with a computer program or whatever. But you can see there is no grouping, no other systematic limitations. Everybody has an equal chance of being selected and every possible group of, of that many people has an equal chance of being selected. That's what I'm looking for. So the purpose of a study is usually to ask a question. The answer to that question is called the random variable. Random variable can be categorical. In other words, the answer puts you in a category or a group. They might ask, what's your favorite color? Well, if you answer blue, that puts you in the group of people that, that chose blue as their favorite color. Who are you going to vote for in the next election? If you choose candidate A, it puts you in the group of people that chose to vote for candidate A in the next election. All yes or no questions are categorical. Numerical, the answer is a number. Numerical data, numerical random variables get split into two types. There's discrete. In discrete, the number is counted. How many classes are you taking this semester? You'd count one, two, three, four, five. Continuous is measured. How much do you weigh? Well, you'd have to measure that. And the rounding is just determined by you. Um, if there's a natural rounding, it might still be discrete. Like money, um, sometimes that can be dis considered discrete because it's natural to round to the nearest penny. You can count pennies. But your age, that can be discrete because you usually say the number of years you've been alive. You don't get it down to the hundredths of a second. So you count the number of years since you've been born. But the time it takes to tie your shoes or the time it takes to complete a task, that's continuous because you have to decide where you're going to round that off. Are you going to time it to the tenth of a second, the hundredth of a second, the thousandths? There is no natural decision there. You have to decide where, where that time is going to be rounded. Um, so let's look at types of studies for gathering data. One is an observational study. In an observational study, we observe the characteristics of a selected group. So you select a group and you just sit back and watch, see what happens. Or we look at data that has already been gathered. That can be an observational study. You don't actually impose any conditions. You just watch what's happening. Um, like a nature uh, observation. That's an observational study. You might watch the lions attack the gazelle. We don't, you don't get a gazelle and send it out there in front of the lions. Um, you didn't do that. You, we don't have that kind of power. Um, you just watch to see what happened. That's observational. An experiment, you intentionally manipulate a variable. This variable is often called the predictor variable or the, um, just lost what I was thinking there, or the explanatory variable. And then observe 
how the response variable behaves. as a result. So what you might do in an experiment is go to bowling alley. Um, you watch people bowl and then they go after their first game, you go and change the balls they're gonna use, make them use a different ball and see how that affects their, their bowling and their score. That's an experiment, you actually changed something. You manipulated it. There's something out there called confounding variables. These are variables that are outside of our control that might affect one or more the other variables. Um, a, fa a great example is, let's say you're measuring people's weight and their height. And you determine that as people get heavier, they get taller. Well, gaining weight isn't gonna make you taller, but getting older might make you both taller and make you gain weight. So there's that confounding variable of age that affected both of the other variables you were looking at. So we wanna look at experimental design. First, there's random assignment. In a random assigned experiment, you just randomly assign subjects to treatments. So you take all the subjects that are chosen and you just randomly pick, you know, you go there, you go here. Obviously, it's a little more official that you throw them in a hat and you draw out half the names and those are in sample A and the others are in sample B. I'm just randomly assigned. No, no uh, predetermined knowledge of the candidates at all other than the fact that they are in the group. There's blocking. In a block design, you divide, you use the extraneous variables. Extraneous means they're not really part of the study to group the subjects. Then you split each group. So let's say I want to test a new heart medication. Well, I might group my subjects as severe heart problems, moderate heart problems, or um, mild heart problems. So I might find if I'm testing my two medications or my two treatments, I might find that treatment A works a lot better on those with severe heart conditions, but the two treatments work about the same on people with moderate or, or mild conditions. So that blocking allows us to, it's actually a way of kind of almost like a stratified sample of keeping certain characteristics on each side of the, the ball and allowing us to compare different, different characteristics to the results of our study. So direct control means that we purposely hold all extraneous variables constant, at least to the degree that we can. So in a drug test, you might, everybody stays there so they have the same living conditions. They're all on the same diet. You feed them so they all have the exact same diet, required exercise or whatever, so that all those other conditions are, are out the door. In reality, it's, it's almost impossible to have perfect direct control. There's always extraneous variables that sneak into it. Replication is very important in a valid experiment. It's the ability to repeat the results <clears throat> with a different sample. Happens all the time. <clears throat> Somebody does a study, they get this really significant result. Other people go to try to do the same study and cannot get that same result to, to occur. <clears throat> a placebo is a tool that is used um, it looks exactly like a treatment, but there's no active ingredient. No um, medical, if you're looking at medicine, there's no medical validity to it. Like one, one group might get an injection of a medication, the other group will get an injection of a saline solution. 
So they're still getting the injection. They're going through the stress of getting injected. And, but more importantly, they're also, they don't know if they're getting the medication. So they're mentally, they believe they're getting treated just like anybody else. <clears throat> a single blind, this is used to eliminate those uh, emotional or mental effects that, you know, if you believe you're gonna get better, that goes a long way to getting you better. So in a single blind study, the subjects don't know what treatment they are getting. So again, they're getting a pill every day, but they don't know if that's actually the medication or if it's just a sugar pill um, that's designed to, to make them think they're getting medicated. <clears throat> in a double blind study, all workers in contact with the subjects don't know who is getting the treatment. You know, so if, if you're the person giving out the medications, you know that that's a placebo. You might do something to affect the person to make them get hopeless or whatever. Maybe you're more sympathetic to them or whatever. Uh, you might react to them differently that causes their, them to react to the treatment differently. So most of the time there's a third person that sets up the treatments out there. And then the person who actually administers them to the, the subject has no idea whether that's the actual medication or a placebo. So they can't do anything subtly to influence the other person's attitude, the subject's attitude or anything like that. Okay, so two things left to do. We need to do some mini tab work. That's something I didn't mention in our opening stuff here, mini tab. Um, if you are, mini tab 19 is the version that I have. So I know that does everything we need it to. Um, there are other versions of mini tab out there and I believe they do what we need them to do, but I can't say for certain. Um, I haven't worked with those other versions. Um, Franklin University, you can buy them in a packet with your textbook, or you can contact the bookstore and they can give you instructions as how to purchase it separately. Okay, so let's go to Minitab here. There it is. <clears throat> so this is what Minitab looks like. There are three tasks that we need to be able to do this week. One of them is to make a bar graph. So I'm, I've got some data sets here that I am gonna bring in. The first data set is two classes at a school. I'm just, is class A and class B. We're surveyed to see how they get to school. Whether they rode the train, a car, or dropped off in a car, or if they rode a bus. So if I wanna make a bar graph. Now one big difference here between this and Excel is notice there's this blank row up here. That is the title row. We name our columns in that row. Um, I'll go back, somebody's got a question here. You do need a class key to register in WebAssign. If you look up at the preliminary objects, there should be an object that says that has the, the getting started in WebAssign, the class key should be in there for you. Um, so you do have to get used to naming these and you have to make sure that they all have a different name. If you try to name two columns the same thing, a mini tab is gonna get upset with you. So we're gonna go up here to graph. These graphs are arranged very uh, specifically. These are multivariable data here. This is numerical plots here and here. And then this is our categorical plot. So this is a bar chart for categorical data. So we select bar chart. There's three different options here. Counts of unique values. That's where you just have a list of the responses and you want Minitab to count them and group them together. That's what we're doing here. A function of a variable, we're not gonna get into that in this course, that's a little bit more of an advanced thing. Or values from a table, and we'll look at that example in a little bit. So right now we want counts of unique values. We hit okay, and what we need to select what variable we want it to count. So we're gonna take transportation. So I'm gonna double click it, and there's transportation, transport. Now these options here allow us to do different things with our data labels. Um, I could add use Y labels, but I'll come back and do that later. I'm just gonna click okay for now. It's gonna give me a basic graph. <clears throat> Running a little bit slow tonight. 
there's our basic graph. We got the number that have bus, car, train. Now what I have up here, this is not the actual, this is a picture of the graph, not the graph itself. If I want to edit it, most of the time I have to double click it to open up the edit window. So I can right click here and go to graph options. Uh, maybe I want to show Y as a percent rather than a number. Rather than knowing that 15 people rode the bus, maybe I want to know what percent that is of the total. Well, that's 50% of the total. Mm -hmm. I might want to do them in, de in increasing order from least frequency to, to greatest. And I'll switch them in order. If I go default, I think default, I think it goes automatically goes alphabetically is the way Minitab organizes them. If I want to go back and change a setting in the main graph thing, I click this little window up here. It takes us back to the last um, command window that we had open. So I'm going to go to my labels here. I'm going to click data labels. I'm going to say use Y value labels. What that does is you notice now each bar has the number on top. There are 15 that rode the bus, 10 that were dropped off in a car, five that rode a train. So little things that we can do there. What if, oops, we've got some questions here. Let me jump back here. No problem. Go ahead and go when you need to. You've been here for an hour. You're good. Um, the code and stuff, if you need to, you can get a temporary access to WebAssign. Um, the instructions are on WebAssign as to how you do that. I believe it's for up to two weeks. So you can get your temporary access and within two weeks you have your code so you can enter your code so it'll convert it over to a regular account rather than a temporary account. What about Make the mind tap? Um, mind tap is not really um, part of this course. What, whatever you have access to comes with the WebAssign. Um, mind tap is really just the, the e-textbook. Um, so that is, is all part of your WebAssign stuff. So there shouldn't be anything separate for that. Okay, thank you. You bet. Okay, so let's say I want to split these up by class. So I'm going to go back to graph here again. Now notice this is not like Excel where you select the area first, then you go. I select the command first and then I, then I tell it what data to use. So this time I'm gonna say I want, I'm gonna leave it as counts of unique values, but I'm gonna ask for a cluster bar graph. This is saying I'm gonna cluster them by one variable and then split them up by the other. So I start out, let's do class and transportation. So say I'm gonna cluster them by class, then split them up by transportation. So this is class A and class B, and then within each class, the type of transportation they used. Contrast that with if I did it the other way. I click transportation first, I'm gonna get rid of that. Transportation first and then class. Now this is gonna group them by their type of transportation, bus, car, or train, and then what class they're in, A or B. Um, no, if you don't get the 80% threshold, you can go back and just do individual questions for the homework. For the quiz, you can't do that. But for the homework, you should be able to redo individual questions. Okay, so that is that, that uh, group data like that. Next, well, what if I want to do it from a chart rather than having the data? What if I actually have a data chart? So I'm going to bring in a data chart. Now, this is different data. Not the same numbers by any means. So I'm going to select graph, bar chart, values from a table. Now I'm going to keep it as just a simple table. So now I have to select my values. Well, frequency is my only numerical column here. Notice there's a T and C1 and C2 and C4 have a T in it. That means that those are categorical variables there. This C5 is just left alone. That means that's a numerical data set. So I choose my numerical data set, my frequency. Click here for my categorical data set. That's going to be my mode that I'm going to use for that. Again, make sure you see that I noticed that I uh, labeled that as mode rather than transport again, just because I need to make sure there's different names for those. And here it goes. It just grasps my table for me. Now, if I go back to here again, I can click on labels and say, you know, add the, the Y label. So it gives me the, the numbers on each column. So I can add those in at any time. So that is the bar graph.
Oops, I want to go back here. Stage, I forgot something. How about the the group bar graphs that we have here? Um, we can actually convert those if we want to. I'm trying to remember where I do it here. Is it here? Nope. Oh yeah, it is. So I, I open it up and I just right click on it and I do graph options. And here it says stack innermost groups. If I click that, it'll convert it from being several bars to being stacked. So within the buses, the blue part of the bar is from class A, the red was from class B. I could have done that with my other one as well. If I open that up, I'll right click and go to graph options, stack the innermost. And now this is class A, the blue are those that rode the bus, the red are those that are dropped off in a car and the yellow is the train. I can switch it back just as easily by right clicking, go to the graph options and just unclick that little checkbox. And there we are. Okay, let's look at a pie chart. So pie chart, again, categorical data. A mini tab does not do well with counting the variables for pie chart. So typically we give it a little table like this for a pie chart. So we're going to graph pie charts down there by the bar chart. That's the categorical section. We're going to click charts from values from a chart. Click our categorical variable. This is the causes. So what we're looking at here, this data set is a tire shop that replaces you know, automobile tires, looking at the different causes for the tire needing to be replaced. Could be a puncture in the tire, broken bead, worn out, bad valve stem, or sidewall damage. So the categorical variable is those causes. The summary variable, well, that is labeled FRAQ, so that's, that's what we use for the summary variable. And we'll click OK, and there's our pie chart. There's a lot of things we can do with this. Let's open it up. If we right click and go chart options, rather than just having the bars listed or the wedges listed around there, I can go from smallest to largest. This would be increasing volume. Click OK. Notice this is the smallest and they get bigger as we go around. Or I can go opposite and go decreasing. It goes from largest to smallest. There's my biggest and they get smaller as we go around. Or I can change where they start. 90 degrees is up and down. So that's where they're starting from right now is is that vertical spot, but I could change that to 180 degrees. So now they start over here is 180 degrees. They start from there and wrap around. Now if I go back in here, let's do click on labels, slice labels. Maybe I want to put the name of the category in there and its percent. I could do the free, well, I'll do the frequency as well. I can include them all What the heck. And then I click OK and notice each slice now has you know, puncture. There's 93 of them that are punctures. That's 20.9%. Broken bead, there's 178 that had broken beads. That's 40%. Now, since I have these labeled, I might not want this key over here anymore. So I just right click that and hit delete and make it go away. Actually, sorry, left click that and hit delete and make it go away. And I have a pie chart. Next thing we want to do is a dot plot. So this is a numerical variable. So what I'm going to do here is I'm looking at, we have two professors that teach sections of the same course. And let's say they want to compare the performance of their students. So they write an exam together and they give a common exam to their groups of students. The scores of those students are going to be recorded here. So the first column tells us what section they're in, if they're in class A or class B, professor A or professor B basically. And the second column is their score. So we're gonna go to graph. Now dot plots up here in the numerical graphs, so it's like dot plot. And we're just gonna select simple. And we have to select from one of our numerical variables. Well, score is the one we want. We click okay and there is our dot plot. Now we can make that bigger or smaller as we want to. You can see there's no, nobody scored 95, nobody scored 85. There's some gaps in there, but they do seem to be relatively evenly spread out. Now I can open that up. There we go. If I right click, I can edit. Figure region, I can do some custom things with how everything is sized, a location of everything. 
I'm going to go back. I'm going to make another one. It's graph dot plot. This time I'm going to go with groups. So what I have to do is I have to find the variable I'm graphing is still the score. But this is the groups I want to divide it up at. I'm going to divide them up by their section. So you see what happens here is everybody from section A is in this top dot plot. Section B is in the bottom dot plot. So you see their performance, ah, they're, they're both kind of equally spread out. Um, B might have a few more lower scores and a couple less higher scores, but they're pretty even. I can select graph, op, graph options, I can select stack dots. You see what happens now is the blue dots are from section A, the red squares are from section B. I'm not a big fan of that display, but there are some times you might want it. We can go back and uncheck it and it goes back and splits it into two separate graphs. I prefer it as two separate graphs like that myself. So those are the different graphs that we need to be able to do for this week in Minitab. Each week I will try to go over all of the different um, functions you need to be able to perform in Minitab to complete that week's assignments. Now with that said, um, I know many of you are probably proficient in Excel. <clears throat> If you use Excel, there is no penalty for that. However, there are going to be some tasks as the year goes on that cannot be done in Excel, that only, only Minitab has the functionality. So you'll still need Minitab for, for the course because there are just things that Excel cannot do. Excel is a general data management software. It's not a statistical software, where Minitab is a specific statistical software. Um, the software, there's an access code to on the hub that you can get with your textbooks from the bookstore, um, or you can buy it separately. Um, actually, I believe the bookstore may have separated it, so you have to request it to get that now. But you can, you should be able to buy access through the Franklin Bookstore for Minitab. Okay, so the last item of business that we have to do tonight is our meat quiz. So we're going to do this as there's two things we want to ask here. So the first thing we're going to ask, there's a hospital that wants to survey their employees about their benefits, about their insurance benefit. So they're looking at how they're going to do the survey. The first way they're going to do it is they're going to divide the employees into groups by department and shift. So obstetrics day shift, obstetrics night shift, orthopedics day, orthopedics night, and so on. Oncology day, oncology night, and on through the group. Then they're going to randomly select eight entire groups. Now that's the key phrase there. Eight entire groups and survey every member in those selected groups. Again, they're going to survey every member in the group, not just randomly selected items from each group. The second method they could use is to put all the employee IDs into a spreadsheet, have the computer assign random numbers and sort them, and whichever ones sort to the top are in the sample. The third method is divide the employees by job classification. So they're divided by a characteristic. Nurses, CNAs, administrative, doctors, support staff, etc. Then randomly select proportional amounts from each group. There's the other keyword, proportional amounts from each group. Number four, um, they want to survey one out of every 20 employees. So let's say they use a time clock. They'll randomly select a number, one through 20. In this case, let's say they selected 14. And then they'll survey that employee and then every 20th employee after that. So they'd survey the, the 14th employee, the 34th, the 54th, the 74th, the 94th, and on up the line. So you don't have to answer these. You met your requirement by being here tonight. So so don't worry, just I want you to take a minute to think about those and how you would answer them. We're going to go over them here in just a second. So for the first one up here, employees are divided into groups and then whole groups are selected. That is a cluster sample. The key is they were divided by convenience, day, night, department, whatever. And then the whole group was selected. 
Every member of the group was selected. The IDs in a spreadsheet, that is a simple random sample. There are no characteristics that are used to divide them up. They're just all thrown in there and chosen out. Number three, divided by job classification and proportionally select from each. That is stratified. The word proportional is the big key there. And then of course, select randomly select one through 20 and then every 20th one after that, that is systematic. Now the big ones people confuse are one in three. Again, cluster sample, the whole group gets selected for the sample. Stratified sample, proportional amounts from each group are selected for the sample. Both of them involve grouping. The second part down here, what type of data is being described in each of these? So the first example here, number five, the survey asked what each candidate who they will vote for in the next election. Number six, the length of each part produced by a machine is measured and recorded. And number seven, the number of times an employee has been late for work in the last year. Again, take a second to think about those. So for number five, who will you vote for in the next election? That is categorical. Number six, the length of a part. That's obviously numerical. But with numerical, we should ask discrete or continuous. So this is measured, so it is continuous. And the last one, number of times you're late for work, that's numerical. It is counted, so it is discrete. Now again, you're here tonight. You don't need to submit anything. Those of you that are watching this on the recording and did not attend live, you will need to submit these to me as an email, um, as the meet quiz to meet your obligation for attending the meet session. So with that, does anybody have any questions for me? Okay, that is a mouthful. I realize it's a lot of stuff to look at for one night. So you all have a great week. I'm gonna shut off the recording. Uh, anybody